Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A very powerful word in the Bible is the word restoration. And we should not only want ourselves to be restored back to God, but also others. And that's exactly the great desire of the Apostle Paul, that God might use him to bring other people back to a right relationship with God and an eternal relationship with God. Well, we've been studying for the last uh, few weeks the book of Galatians. And we've seen how that there is confusion concerning the gospel, that plan of salvation, how one ought to apply the word of God to one's life concerning the Galatians. And for the first five chapters, Paul has been teaching biblical truth. And now he's asking the people there to put it into practice, to apply it to their life. So with that said, take out your Bible, and let's look at the final chapter of this epistle to the Galatians, chapter 6, and we'll begin with verse 1. Now, notice what Paul writes to this congregation. He says here, brethren, if any man is overcome. Now, he's talking about the outcome of temptation. We'll see that in a moment. So if anyone is overcome, and the implication is with temptation. He says, in any certain type of offense. Now, this word for offense, it might be translated a variety of ways in in English, but it's the word which means to fall alongside. And the image here is of war. We need to realize that, that spirituality is indeed a war, a war between the flesh and the spirit between demonic influence and the anointing and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can imagine if there's a battle going on that there'll be people who fall along the side. That is, that they're injured. And that's what Paul is likening this situation to, that there's casualties, spiritually speaking. And what does he say? Well, if uh, any man should be overtaken in some offense, they had fallen along the way. He says, you, and once again, this is uh, emphatic. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to those individuals in Galatia that have, have come to the conclusion, what is the true gospel? How one is saved. That is, those who have taken those words in this epistle to heart, and they have applied them to their life. And now he says, those of you who are spiritual, what is your job? And here's this word, restore. Restore those others who have fallen. He says, restore these same ones in how? A spirit of humility. Now, let me just point out, and we see this in many different uh, expressions in the scripture, that, that God's work is not going to be realized in your life from a personal standpoint, oh, you're not going to have an effective ministry unless you, you walk in a spirit of humility. So he says, you who are spiritual, and what does he link with that? Humility. It is impossible to be spiritually empowered and, and, and not be humble. These two things work together. So he writes here, you who are spiritual, you restore those in the spirit of humility. And then he gives a warning. Now, in Jerusalem, many of you know the Mount of Olives, but there's also another significant mountain, Mount Scopus. And Scopus is really meaning to scope or to look out. And this is the same word that he used in the biblical language here. He says, watch out yourselves. Now, it's kind of redundant. But he wants to emphasize how important this looking out is. Looking out for what? Well, look again. He says, 
Look out yourselves that you are not also tempted. Now, that's why I said this word here is so important, temptation. When we are not walking humbly, it is an invitation to the enemy, and I'm speaking about demonic influence, speaking about Satan. It is an influ- it's an invitation to him to come and set before us temptation. We talked about how there's an inherent relationship between humility and the spirit. So am I walking in pride? What's going to be the outcome? I'm going to be spiritually weak. Satan knows this, and what's he going to do? He's going to place before me a temptation, and what am I going to be? Well, I might have went with the best intentions. I may have went to those who had fallen along the side with the purpose of restoring them. But what's going to happen? In the way there, I'm going to fall along the side too. I'm going to succumb to temptation because I'm not spiritually strong because of pride in my life. Move on to verse 2. He says here, and, and the burden of one another you bear. Now, we need to pay attention to that word burden because another verse is going to have that same word, usually translated the identical, in the, the next verse or in the verse coming, but uh, it's going to be a different word. So look again at verse 2. The burden of one another you bear and thus you fulfill the law of Messiah. Now, the law of Messiah, it is rooted, we saw this in the previous chapter, it is rooted in love. So when we are concerned, when we see someone who is under a burden, and this word burden can also mean an a spiritual attack those who are suffering in some way, those who are not receiving the blessings of God, they are under spiritual attack, oppression, whatever. We have a call, and it's exactly what he's been talking about, restoration. He says, we have a call to restore those. And in doing so, he says, you will fulfill the law of Messiah, rooted in love. Move on to verse 3. For... If a certain one thinks to be to be something. Now, this first part of this third verse has to do with, with pride. That is, we think that we're really something, but he says, in actuality, he says, but but being not, what happens? It says, you deceive, this one deceives himself. Now, deception, this word deception is inherently related to the Garden of Eden where we see that Chava, or Eve, was deceived by the Satan. Why? Because she was looking at things from her perspective. Remember what the text says? We read in Galatians chapter 3 that she looked at that fruit which God says, do not eat. And the Bible says she saw that it was good. Who says it was good? Good according to her vision. So she was operating in pride. Why do I say that? Because God says, stay away from that. It is not good. And she, in her own mind, thought she could overrule the truth of God. That she was in a better position to determine what was good for her or not. And let me just simply say, there's many people who behave that way who look at situations and instead of framing their life, and this is going to be important in a moment, instead of framing their life spiritually with the Word of God, with the boundaries and the the provision of the Holy Spirit, we think we can go it alone according to what we think is best for us, according to what we desire. And what we're doing is walking after temptation, we're walking in not humility, but in the imaginations of our heart, which is deceitful above all things. And what's going to happen? Great failure, spiritual failure. So he says, look again in verse 3, for if anyone thinks that he's something when being nothing, he deceives himself. What should we do? Verse 3 or verse 4, he writes, but... Let everyone, and he uses a word, where we get the English word document or prove. 
let everyone prove his own work. Now, it's talking here, it's very important that we see that there's a, a change. He's talking about us walking, behaving in spiritual maturity. And each person, they have received a, a plan for their life. That's what the Spirit of God reveals. Now, we don't get all the blueprints, everything in one moment. It develops over time. But God has a plan, a purpose for each person. And what are we supposed to do? To fulfill that. And that's why he writes, look again at verse 4. But the work of each one, let him prove. Then in himself alone shall he boast. Now this word boast is a word of, of contentment. It's not rooted in pride, but contentment and praise for what God has done in us and through us. It is the joy, and some English translation calls it rejoicing, and that gets really to the heart of the matter. It's a joy from knowing that God has used us, and we have submitted out of obedience, and God's work was accomplished in and through us. So that's what he's talking about that each one will have that, that joy, that, that, that boasting in his own deed and not in that of another. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, again, he's switched uh, context. He's not talking about assisting those any longer who have fallen. He's not talking about bearing someone's burden, that is, when someone's suffering because of, of spiritual failure or because of persecution or because of something lacking in their life. He's not talking about how we have the responsibility to assist, to bless, to, to help that person. He's talking now about an individual call. And what he wants to emphasize is this. God is going to supply to you what is required for you to walk in obedience, for you to faithfully carry out God's will for your life? Don't allow you to fail and someone else has to come in and complete the work so that the rewards that God wanted to give to you, that you're not going to get them all. So he says, you know, let everyone be, be faithful to their own call, that they might rejoice in that and not have to, to share that with someone else. Look at verse 5. For he says there, For let everyone bear his own. And this is important because this is that place where most English Bibles translates the word burden. Let everyone bear his own burden. But it's not. It's a different biblical word. And this word is also used in the Greek language for, for cargo. So it's, it's, it's having to do with something that you're supposed to bear, but it's work-related. It is a word that tells us we're not talking about suffering some attack, having some failure in our life that we need to be ministered to and restored. No, he's talking here about each one bearing what God has called us to do. Don't uh, uh, be dependent upon someone else to do your own work. Well, let's move on. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 6. Now, here he's talking about sharing. And when God uses people in your life, uh, you should share the outcome of that truth. That is, the blessings that God provides. Look at verse 6. He says, but, and that's how we know that we're dealing with a, a somewhat different uh, issue because he uses that word day in, in Greek, which shows a contrast or a new subject. So he writes, But the one who is taught the word of God, let him share with the one who teaches in all good things. So what's he talking about here? As, as, God, as God supplies truth to you through someone else, and that truth blesses you, what he's saying here is that you should, should have them share in, in those blessings. So, for example, your spiritual leader at the congregation that you worship in, or perhaps your, your Sunday school teacher, or someone else in your neighborhood at work who is giving you spiritual counsel like a mentor, those people, when that truth is a blessing to you and you begin to reap the outcome, include them in that, those blessings. Verse, verse 7 it's a warning. 
do not be deceived. Now, that's the second time he's talked about deception. And what he's saying in a, a underlying way is this. The Galatians, you have been deceived. Not by those who have come to share with you truth, but by those who want to exalt themselves. And when we want that same thing, what's going to happen? We're going to be deceived as well. Whenever we are motivated by exalting self, which is the opposite of humility, whenever that becomes the framework of our life, we're going to be failing God. We're going to be open up for the attacks and the oppression and the influence of, of demonic influence of the enemy. So he writes, look at verse 7. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. Now, what that word mocking has to do is, is God's not going to be set aside. You can't simply put God out of your life. That judgment of this righteous God will indeed find you out. And in order to illustrate that, notice what he writes in the next verse, verse 8. Because, and this ties it together with what we've just heard, you cannot mock God, you cannot say, God, I want you out. These principles, these truths, I'm not going to submit to and not think that there's going to be a, a, a result. There will be a result. So he says, look at verse 8. Because the one who sows in the flesh of himself or in his own flesh, out of the flesh, he will reap what? Destruction. Now, there's another way that that word is often translated, and, and the outcome is destruction. But the reason why many English translations render it as decay is because it's a process. That is, we don't violate spiritual truth and immediately suffer destruction. Usually, it's a process. It takes place over time. And most scholars would tell you that that timing is for the purpose of repentance. You know, we've seen many places in the scripture. The Bible talks about God being long-suffering. Why? Because he does not want to see the ultimate destruction of anyone. So he's long-suffering for the purpose of repentance. That as you begin to feel the emptiness of sin in your life, as you begin to see the distance of the Holy Spirit, you grieving him, hindering him, and feeling the effects of that, that you might repent. In other words, where do we begin today? That you might be restored to the truth and the intimacy of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So he writes, verse 8, Because the one who sows out of his own flesh, it says, he will reap that, that destruction. But the one who sows in the Spirit, out of the Spirit, he will reap. And don't miss what he says. It says eternal life. Now, most people, when they see that, the only thing that comes into their mind is heaven. But we need to see it in a more, what we could say, culturally established interpretation. Now, why do I say that? Because everlasting life is not so much a, a phrase that links it to the heaven, but links it to the kingdom. In the, the Hebrew language, the word olam, which can mean world, can also mean eternity, or the eternal world is a reference for the kingdom. And when it talks about that he will reap eternal life, what he's talking about is that you're going to reap the effects of the kingdom. And that first and foremost is a kingdom character. So don't read this verse with saying, well, that's good news because when I die, when I die, when I'm done with this body, I'll go into the heavens and, and that's that. No, that phrase has to do with a present possibility that you might inherit what? A kingdom lifestyle when even today. That you might live according to kingdom truth. And that kingdom truth, as we've said many times, is going to manifest the glory of God and is going to be a great instrument of leading others to be restored to living God. 
We'll move on to verse 9. He writes, and notice the connection. He, he talks about in verse 9, not to be weary in doing good. When? In heaven? Absolutely not. He's talking about that in this body. We're not going to get tired in the heaven. We're not going to wear out in the kingdom of God. So notice what he writes in the connection to a kingdom lifestyle in this present age. He says, and, and the doing of good, do not be weary. For in its own time or season, we will inherit if we do not become, and the word, probably the best English word is despondent. That is discourage. And here's what happens. Many people have a spiritual maturity like a, a, a dolphin or a seal. Why do I say that? Well, I was watching not too long ago a National Geographic special, and they were training seals to patrol the ports. And the seal, I mean, he can do such a better job than, than individuals. He's faster. He is not bound with the same restraints of his human being and the equipment. And he does his loop. He scans everything so quickly, and he comes back up. And what does he want? Payday. He wants that fish. And if he doesn't get that fish after he completes that circle, I mean, it is a crisis for him. And it's going to affect his performance the next time around. He misses a few fish. He's done. He's not going to work any longer. Well, a lot of people are spiritually mature like that seal. Because what happens is this. We, we begin a good walk. We walk in faithfulness. We walk in trust. And what happens? Well, we think we need that immediate uh, response from God. And if we don't reap those blessings, if we don't see God's uh, faithfulness immediately, what happens? We become despondent. We become uh, discouraged in doing good, and we walk away. Here's the problem. People did good. Why? For a payday. They didn't mature enough to understand that we do good for the sake of goodness because it's righteous. It is a privilege to walk in faithfulness to the plans and the purposes and the character of God. So he says here, it's a promise. God's going to be faithful. In its proper season, God is going to bestow upon us the outcome of our obedience but it's not necessarily immediate. It's in its proper season according to God's timing. Look on to verse, verse 10. He says, therefore, we have what? He says, therefore, we have an opportunity. Or it could say, therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to who? To all. Now, this is an important statement. We need to understand that whomsoever we might meet, God's providing an opportunity for us to serve him by ministering to them. And God uses this in the broadest language. So he says, as we have season, or probably better in English, as we have opportunity, let us do good. What is that? Well, there's an inherent relationship between the word good and the will of God. But there's also a connection between good and the commandments. And that's what we're supposed to do. What is the basis of the commandments? We learned in the previous chapter, chapter five, that, that all the law can be summarized with love your neighbor as yourself. So he says he's coming back to that. Those who are restored are going to want to love their neighbor, to minister to them. But notice that he says there's an emphasis. He says, but in particular, or the main thing is to what? To do so of the household of faith. So first and foremost, we're supposed to be watching out for one another, those who share in the faith of Messiah. Also, we can expand that to the non-believer. But there's an emphasis in watching out, taking care of, ministering to, blessing, helping those of the household of faith. Now, when we look at this passage, we can summarize it in one sentence. 
Restoration leads to obedience. Is one saved by that obedience? Absolutely not. Is is one made a new creation because of that obedience? No, he's not. It is by faith through the grace of Messiah that one becomes that new creation. We're going to talk about that next week. And that's the, the main thing. Why? Because it's only when we're that new creation, then and only then, will God move in our life by means of the Holy Spirit and we can grow and we can mature and we can begin to walk in obedience. And what's the outcome of that? The outcome is the manifestation of God's glory. So look again at at our last verse today, verse 10. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let me ask you something. Are you looking? Are you praying for opportunities to be used by God? that you might do good for someone else. That's what the scripture is commanding here in verse 10. That's the attitude of someone who has been restored to God. So he says here, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work the good. That is, let us do according to the will, the plans, the purpose, the character of God to all people. That is, God, and sometimes it's not that we're, we're, we're asking God to create a situation, but we find ourselves in a situation daily. No matter where we may be, God can use those as opportunities to manifest His goodness to others, that they might see that, experience that, and see you as the instrument of that. And do what? was Yeshua taught elsewhere in that Sermon on the Mount that they might see our good works and glorify our Heavenly Father because they see that it's not us. We're just an instrument. We're just the vessel that God uses. And they see that transformation of being restored to a right relationship, an eternal relationship with God. So let me ask you a question as we conclude. What's it going to take for you to desire that restoration? What's it going to take for you to say, Oh God, I am desperately in need of your mercy, your forgiveness. Until you reach that point, I can assure you that God's going to be very silent and distant in your life. Well, we're out of time. Until next week. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.